Inshallah, to continue with the program, we are inviting our honorable scholar, Mufti Muhammad ibn Adam al Kawthari, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, a brief introduction. The Shaykh is uh, a student of the Islamic sciences and he has been studied in a number of uh, countries, including the United Kingdom, Pakistan, as well as Syria, and he has formal authorizations in the disciplines of the Islamic sciences, including uh, fiqh, and that's why we call him a mufti, one who gives uh, legal verdicts. And he continues to inspire the youth through his courses, as well as his speeches. He's attended the RIS, as well as a number of youth tarbiya events that took place in the past year at the Islamic Foundation of Toronto. It's been a few years, but we are very pleased that he is back in Toronto, even though it's for a short while. And you can visit his website where all his work is there. He has also authored some of the uh, books in the Islamic sciences. And the website is dawlifta.com. He also has a Twitter and a Facebook account. And you can follow him and be his fan on uh, his social media pages. So with this brief introduction, we request our Honorable Sheikh, Mufti Muhammad ibn Adam al Kawthari Hafizahullah, to come forward and deliver a speech on the topic of the pure hearted. Zadla Khir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu bihi wa nasta'afiruhu wa nasta'adih. Wa na'udhu billahi ta'ala min shuroori anfusina wa min siyaati a'amalina. من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمد عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الجميع وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وجدنا علما وعملا يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه وبعد اسمك البارز وسيسترس السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته First of all I would like to thank Islamic Foundation, Sheikh Yusuf Badat, the committee, the organization, the volunteers for arranging this very important program, inviting all of us today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept everyone's efforts. It's a personally a, an honor, a privilege to be here with you, as Sheikh Yusuf was saying, who is a very close dear friend of mine, that I attended the Youth Tarbiya conferences which were taking place, actually quite a few of them, around 2007, 2008, 9, 10, I think about four years, five years. For the past few years, uh, I haven't uh, attended them. MashaAllah, the Islamic Foundation has been known for, or you can call them the pioneers, in arranging these youth programs. Many, many years. I don't know if it's what 15th, 10th, or 18th was it, uh, the conference you had last year. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the efforts uh, of this foundation, this masjid, this organization, the volunteers, the hard work done by Shah Yusuf and his team. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward also the sisters. No program takes place without the efforts and volunteering of the sisters. May Allah reward everyone, inshallah, and accept from us all. A very important topic that we have today, and I was very happy to see this very important uh, subject being discussed. I am not, as you may know from my accent, not from Canada. I am from the United Kingdom and from England. But I know, I have been following what's happening here, and actually it's the same in our country. We are going through the same things in terms of the curriculum, uh, and the sex education. Um, uh, so the same things are in, in the UK as well. We just had an election and some of these things were actually discussed by the Muslim communities. So this, this topic is a very important topic. 
I want to, like my topic or my title, uh, as Sheikh Yusuf mentioned, is the pure heart. I want to talk about the heart. I want to talk about modesty, bashfulness to an extent. I want to also talk about some important responsibilities for the elders and also for the youth how the elders and the youth, the parents and the younger generation can work together. I also want to talk about how at home, at, at our homes, we need to have an Islamic environment and also briefly maybe touch upon in terms of the curriculum and, and, the, and the schools. But there's a big responsibility alongside the efforts that we make in terms of what we want our children to study. And sometimes what happens is that our focus, rightly so, Muslims are standing up, our focus, sometimes it's only and solely on the curriculum or what's the bill that's being passed. What's, what are we doing about our responsibility at home as parents? What are we doing at home, how we are bringing our children up? So I want to talk about all of this related and connected to all inshallah. The pure-hearted Muslim or Muslim, Islam places a lot of importance, great deal of significance, importance on possessing, having a heart that is pure. In the Arabic language, heart is known as qalb. The Quran says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُوا مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On the day of judgment, Nothing will benefit. No wealth, no children. Nothing will benefit in the next life. This is what Allah is saying. The thing that will really benefit someone is a heart that is pure. Salim. The word Salim means sound heart. Pure heart. Another word for pure is Tayyib. Pure Tayyib heart. That if someone meets Allah, a woman who meets Allah, a man who meets Allah with this clean, sound, pure heart. I want to define this pure heart. But just to mention, start off with this ayah, this verse of the Quran. Then that will benefit a believer in his grave, in her grave, in the next life. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Ayyun nasi afbal? Who is the best of people? Who is the best of human beings? He said, Kullu mahmumil qalbi saduqi lisani. Every person that is truthful in their tongue and their heart is mahmum. So the companion said, O Messenger of Allah, saduqul lisani na'rifu. Truthful tongue, we know what that is. But what's this heart being mahmum? What's mahmumul qalb? That's the person who is the most beloved or afdal, the most righteous person who has these two qualities, truthful tongue and heart is makhmoom. This is a sound hadith. So the companion said, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa what is this makhmoom al-qalb? Listen to the answer of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, you know who, in the one who has heart which is makhmoom, what is that? He said, هُوَ التَّقِيُّ النَّقِيُّ لَا إِثْمَ فِيهِ وَلَا بَغْيَ وَلَا غِلَّ وَلَا حَسْنَ This heart which is known as مَخْمُوم is that heart which is تَقِي and نَقِي تَقِي means it is full of God consciousness full of Allah consciousness always connected to Allah Taqwa is in the heart Nabi, it's clean, pure, shining, silky, clean heart. There is no ithm, there is no sin in that heart. There's no bad thoughts in that heart. It's connected the mind and the brain and the heart. And that's another topic. There is no sin in it. There is no transgression in it. There is no enmity in it. There is no hasad, envy, jealousy in it. Clean hearted person. This is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in another hadith said sometimes Rubba ashrata aghbara yabuddu yadayhi ila sama Rubba ashrata aghbara Law aqsam ala Allah ila barra Sometimes people are clean hearted people If they were to take an oath by Allah Allah will make that happen 
We might think this person is just an innocent person, not sharp, not innocent. Those are the ones sometimes are the most beloved to Allah, the clean-hearted people. Sometimes we think this guy is not sharp, clean-hearted. There's one hadith, and that's another topic where the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that the man was a person of Jannah, and when he was asked what he was doing, he said he sleeps at night and he has no enmity, nothing negative towards anybody. So anyway, cleanliness of the heart. What is this cleanliness of the heart? It's a pure heart. It's a clean heart. And it's not, it's connected. The mind is clean. The thoughts are pure. The desires are clean. The inclinations are pure. The thoughts, the reflections, the pondering. Everything is pure. The person is pure inside. And that reflects that person's external, reflects that person's outside. Purity inside reflects purity outside. And this is the same with Haya. Today's topic is modesty. Modesty is actually reflected by the pure heart. So when someone has a pure, clean, internal, sound, internal, clean heart, then that reflects on the external. That person will have modesty. Modesty starts from inside. And modesty is not just covering. It's not just a hijab. It's not just a niqab. It's not just wearing a scarf. It's not just wearing a hat. It's not just, it is that. But more than that, modesty, haya, is about how a person has dignity, calmness, composure, how a person thinks, how a person talks. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look at his shamalim, how he would converse with people, softly spoken. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was bashful by nature, a handsome man, softly spoken never raises his voice. This is what you call modesty. We sometimes misunderstand what modesty is. A husband who speaks softly to his wife, that's a modest husband. A wife who doesn't nag at her husband speaks softly. A man or a woman of modesty doesn't swear, doesn't slander, does not have a parking argument outside. You're calm, there's dignity, there's respect. This is what you call haya, the way a person eats. There's I came across a hadith recently, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he disliked a person when someone's eating collectively to take two dates in their plate. When you're eating alone, no problem. Why? Because when we're eating together, it's disrespectful to sort of be extra greedy. Like you know, sometimes pizzas are coming, so like I tell my students, you know, you've already eaten one pizza before you you grab another one, put it in your plate, it's going to finish. This goes against haya. You finish your one piece off. You don't show greediness, calmness, waqar, sakina, politeness, gentleness. The way a person walks, gaze is low. Not just lustful gazes, but just generally. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, when he would walk, he would not just, not just look at women, he would not even look at men. He would not look up above, he would not, he would look down. He would walk as though he is descending from a hill. That's how the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa would walk. There's calmness, composure. There's respect in the way we eat, the way we consume food. That's why the ulama say haya and modesty, which is the external manifestation of a pure heart. What is the definition? The definition of that is you stay away from sins, that's without doubt. Haya, the definition is that it's an it's attribute, it's a character trait, it's a characteristic, it's a khuluq, it's a trait, it's a quality, it's an attribute that prevents a person from committing a sin and enables that person to do good actions. But along with that, it also relates to a person avoiding that which is considered to be inappropriate in society. Some things might not be unlawful, inappropriate. Khila, in, in, in the books of hadith, this is known as khilaful muru'ah. You might think, you know, some of these things, we can't even do them now. 
khilaf al muru'ah. You know the examples given by the ulama in the books? Things like someone just standing, you know, somewhere walking and eating, and you know, like the way that you're walking on the streets and eating, on, that's also khilaf al muru'ah. I'm not saying it's haram, I'm just giving an example. In the classical books, you know, in the olden times, the teachers, the muhaddithun, when they saw the students that they're walking on the streets and eating, they would ban them from like studying for a week. You can't go and correct your akhlaq and your character and your bashfulness. It's going against your modesty. We live in a time, you know, the problem is, brothers and sisters, we live, we live in a time where we are desensitized. We have moved far away from the traditional values and the traditional culture. Even in the West, the non-Muslims, we all in the West, but the non-Muslims, even their culture, look back. 40, 50, 60 years ago, there was modesty, there was haya, there was bashfulness. People, you know, part of modesty, and it's not just modesty, it's not, like I said, it's not covering, it's not just covering, sorry, it is covering, but it's not just covering. Because part of modesty, which is the external manifestation of a pure heart, is also in privacy. So if there's nobody, it's actually a makruh dislike to be naked alone in one's bedroom unless there's a need. They say when you, the scholars explain this, the fuqaha of the various schools, when someone is changing clothes, there's a need. When you're taking a bath or a shower, there's a need. Intimacy between spouses, there's a need. But other than that, it's not a good idea to just be naked. And classically, traditionally, People, even when there was a need. I remember my grandfather, Allah Yerhamu, he's passed away. He would go into the bathroom with his, you know, they have that lungi. Yeah, what do you call that? I don't know what you call it in English. Like he would take his bath with that water, you know, his, his, when he was old. No way that I'm going to expose myself fully. There's nobody, the door's locked. That's what, they were traditional values. People were very careful. That's why the hadith says that have modesty before Allah. This is modesty before Allah. It's not just about who sees me and a woman's being seen by, it's about that, but it's more than that. It's beyond that. So this modesty is the external application of purity. The purity, which is the purity of the heart. Like I said, the word tayyib is mentioned. There's a hadith where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna Allah tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. Indeed, Allah is pure. He does not accept anything except but the pure. Tayyib is a word for pure. That's why the Quran says, At-tayyibatu lit-tayyibin. At-tayyibatu lit-tayyibin. Al-khabithatu lit-khabithin. Pure men are for pure women. Impure men are for impure women. A man is impure in his heart and he wants a pure wife. That's not going to work, bro. Sorry, that's uh, British lingo. That's not going to work. If you want a pure wife, full of chastity, full of bashfulness, and full of haya and modesty, and that's the beauty of a woman. Again, you know, our the way we consider things have turned upside down because we're living in that culture society a woman or anyone someone who's outgoing courageous always talking shouting screaming confident good qualities to an extent we think that person has some good qualities but the one who's slightly withdrawn looking down not talking too much we think they've got some syndrome that might just be their good character i heard from one chef once from the Gulf somewhere, that there were two, two sisters, and one of them used to tap, talk all the time, the other one used to like stay quiet. So somebody said that, you know, that one of the sisters seems very intelligent. He said, no, 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 he couldn't understand that. He said, the one who's quiet is the more intelligent one. Because in our culture, the one who talks too much is a sign of khifatul aql. Like, you know, you, your brain's not working, you're just talking, talking, talking. The one who's calm thinks more. Your brain is in function. We think the one who talks more is more intelligent. So calmness is also part of 
purity of the heart. So we live in a society where things have turned, have changed. So anyway, Haya is all of this before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's about wisdom, it's about talking with wisdom, it's about bashfulness. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa the hadith of Bukhari, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أشد حياء من العذراء في خدرها more bashful than a virgin woman in her chamber on the first night of marriage a woman you know but we won't even understand that because a woman in her first night of marriage nowadays no longer are bashful that was that time even the example we won't understand because we live in a society that she's, she's probably already slept with him. I will be like, protect. But, you know, that's why, you know, in the books of Fiqh, they discuss the ruling that when, you, when, when a wali goes to ask, like the father goes to seek permission from his daughter, that such and such, there's a proposal, like, okay, give us permission now. I'm going to conduct your marriage. So if she says quiet and she's, she just smiles and, you know, she says bashful, that's a yes. That's a yes, because a woman will not say, yeah, 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 you know what, yeah, yeah, come on, get him, you know, I want to get married to him, man. Yeah. Bismillah. That's the society. Nowadays, scholars say, no, smiling is not an indication. And, and when we teach the fiqh of marriage, we say, take explicit permission, because times have changed. I'm just going back to a real, traditional, pure society. It was very different in those days. People's thoughts, minds, their, their whims, their desires, their khialat, like we say khial in Arabic or in Urdu. You know, the whole sort of, the way, the thinking process. In every part of the world, traditionally in the Arab world, subcontinent, North Africa, talk to people, traditional places, and there are still places like that traditionally. Those traditional values, so, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was more bashful. When someone would talk to him, he would look down and talk. He would be, he would be like modest, not, what I'm saying, not saying here that you, you sort of become too shy and you can't really do what you want to do. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led armies, he was the head of the Anbiya, he led armies, the head of the Muslims, he led prayer. He did so much service despite being so bashful by nature. So it, there's no contradiction. There could be someone who can do a lot of work, very intelligent, very confident as well, but with bashfulness. For a woman, the beauty of a woman and a man, both, is bashfulness. It enhances the beauty of a woman. I know many brothers who say, they want a wife who's like, who's bashful. Not someone who's like, you know, really. Well, I don't know, different people have different tastes. But it enhances the beauty. It's not just about, I'm trying to point the picture, it's not just about coloring. It's about the way, the words, the language used. Is there dignity in the words used? We use slang language today. The voice being raised or not for men and women. So this is Haya. And this has been mentioned, you must have heard today through, through the course of the day, many hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Al-Haya khayrun kulluhu. Haya is nothing but good. Once somebody was, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed by a man and he was rebuking another person, saying, you know what, you're too modest, you're too shy. Like, come on, it's going to harm you. You know, we tell someone like, come on, stand up for your eyes, you know, you're too shy. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, da'hu, leave him, let him be modest. Because haya and modesty and bashfulness is part of faith. It's part of Iman. Imam Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, one of the great Hanbali scholars, he states that there's two types of haya. One is created. People are born with it. Those people are lucky, fortunate. 
Generally, Imam al Ghazali says this as well. He says that, you know, good character, he says some people are born with good character. They are blessed. That's a ni'mah from Allah. Allah gives different people different ni'mah. It's not favoritism. At the end of it, it balances itself out. So they have a ni'mah in this regard. And others have to work for it. Some people are just born calm, cool, collective, gentle. Like in England, we say cool as a cucumber. And some people are just by nature born with rage, with anger. But that's their challenge. The, the person who's calm, collected, their challenge is in another area. Everybody has different tests and different challenges. So, some people are born with it. He says this is one of the greatest ni'mah. Greatest ni'mah that Allah can give anyone. And others acquire it. And actually the ones who acquire it, their reward is greater. Because they went through a struggle. They went through mujahada. The opposite of haya is what? Adabul haya or shamelessness. So in Arabic we say fahsha, tafahush. Many hadiths of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that talk about this, this fahsha. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you look at his shama'il, لم يكن سبابا ولا he never used to slander ولا he never used to سخابا في الأسواق he never used to yell in the market there's no narration where it's reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yelled imagine he didn't shout one of my teachers was once mentioning that from he related from his teacher that he once said that to his students that have been married for 55 years, by five years. In 55 years of marriage, I've never raised my voice on my wife. Imagine, never raised. Forget domestic abuse and violence. And I'm not saying also that domestic violence is only from men, it happens from women as well. I know that. Many cases. Because sometimes, sorry sisters, you know, I'll get the brothers as well soon, but sometimes some sisters they think, yeah, if we do it, we're women, it's okay, you know. <laughs> but men can't get away with it, women can. No, it's for both. But this, in this example, he said, I never yet raised my voice. This is following the sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This fahsha, this fahsha, lewdness, shamelessness, shamelessness. Our society is filled with shamelessness. And it's sad. It's, some of it's our own fault and some of it's not our fault. We live in this 14th century, okay? It's not our fault. We live in the West, maybe partially in our fault, Allah Allah. But we, we've chosen to live in a society where you walk down the road, there's fitna, there's billboards, the internet, phones, but we can do a lot about it. A lot is in our control. A lot is in our capability, capacity. We can complain all day long, and sorry for being frank, about the curriculum, about sex education. If we don't do anything at home, because this haya, this modesty, purity of the heart, brothers and sisters, starts at home. You know from when? You know from when? Not when your child is six, not when your child is five, not when your child is four, not when your child is three, not when your child is two, not when your child is one, not when the wife is pregnant, before that. That's when it starts. That's we need to work. We need to work for that. There's a hadith in Surah Al-Majah, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, تَخَيَّرُوا لِنُطَفِقُمْ Before you get married, choose where you will plant your seed. In other words, before you get married, don't be selfish. As a man or a woman, don't think about yourself. What kind of wife I want? What kind of husband I want? Think about your future children. What kind of mother I want for my children? Is this man fit enough to be the father of my future children? The rights of your children begin before your own marriage. Because you're choosing the, your, the, their father, you're choosing their mother. And then it starts the thought, the campaigning, about the curriculum, about sex education, about their modesty, about the 
good upbringing starts from then, from marriage. How do you live at home? How do you live at home? When the wife, what type of food you eat? The hadith says, in Allah tayyibun la yaqbaru illa tayyib, Allah only accepts pure. Yeah? In that hadith, the hadith goes on to mention, kulu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba. The verse of the Quran. O oh, believers, eat food, not just halal, eat pure food. You eat pure, you yourself will become pure. Your hearts will become pure. Your children will become pure. What is pure food? You know what pure food is? Everything related to pre-slaughter, to the act, act of slaughter, to the way in which the food was prepared. Who cooked it? A wife, a mother, or a husband? Yeah, men cook as well, alhamdulillah. Cooking whilst making tasbih of Allah. Food is being cooked. Subhanallah wa bihamdi wa subhanallah alayhi wa astaghfirullah wa astaghfirullah la ilaha illallah. Food is being cooked. There are hafizat of the Quran who cook food whilst reciting one, two, three juice of the Quran. Barakat and noor and blessings and light is in the food. That food you eat, your children will be pure. And you go and eat KFC, okay, I don't take any names. You go and eat whatever, whatever. Who cooks it? I'm not talking about haram. I don't even want to go down that road or debate. Who cooks it? Do they care how they cook? Do they have concern in their heart? Who's cooking? Are they swearing when they're cooking? Where is it? That has an impact. You are what you eat. Purity in the home from the food that we eat. Eat healthy food. You know these takeaway restaurants and things like that. Sorry, I know some people might have a business and sorry if I, you know, take... I don't want to harm your business. May Allah give you lots and lots and lots and lots of barakah, inshallah. But we should not have a habit of eating too much outside junk food. Junk food brings junk minds. Junk thoughts. Pure food brings pure thoughts, pure minds. How, at the time of cooking food, if the mother is cooking food whilst watching Bollywood, your child will eat the food and become Salman Khan when he grows up. And if she's reading, listening to a shaykh talking or she's got some nasheed Quran on or whatever, and she's listening about a companion, Aisha radiallahu anha, and she's listening to that, Food will give barakat, your daughter will grow up like Aisha radiallahu anha. When she's breastfeeding, again that's a problem a lot of people don't want to breastfeed today. A great, great, great duty of a mother. It's a rank, breastfeeding is an amazing rank. When you breastfeed, are you watching Bollywood? Or Dollywood or Hollywood? There's Hollywood, there's Bollywood, and then Bangladesh there's Dollywood, and Pakistan is Lollywood. If we're watching that, that's how our children will grow up. Whilst the mother is pregnant, read the books. What, we, what the mothers think has an impact. And this is not just Islamically, there's research done on it. What you eat has an impact on your child, what you think. That's why classically in the olden times, some of the kings and these sultans and amirs, you know what they used to do when their wives became pregnant? For nine months, they used to take them away in some like a lush place where there's rivers and um, good scenery, so they just relax. And wives are thinking today, I wish you could do that. <laughs> For nine months, see greenery, just relax, no tension. During pregnancy, if there's no tension, the child grows up with good akhlaq. If you're fighting as a husband and a wife and the child is in the stomach, that child's gonna come out as a fighting child. Well, how automatically bad akhlaq? The child is hearing, the child is in the stomach. Put the Qur'an on. When a, when a woman is pregnant, keep the Qur'an inside the house. Listen to lots of Qur'an. This is why scholars say that whilst a woman is pregnant at that time, specifically, just avoid sins and anything distasteful or anything disliked. All of this contributes to the healthy society at home, pure homes. And then when children are born, 
Again, we don't, we're desensitized. We don't realize mother, father, daughter, son, all watching Bollywood together. Like, how is that even possible? Seriously, I don't get it. Like, haya from like your own sister, brothers, like, you know, Bollywood. I know what Bollywood is, yeah? Everyone knows what Bollywood is. I don't know how bad it is, whatever, now or whatever, but it must be like really, you know, dancing and all these kind of things going on. I mean, like, families together. How is he, how can you even like, watch that? See nudity on the screen and then like, your dad sitting there, your mother's like, It's just not possible for anybody with a sound nature. So these movies at home, we do all that at home and then we, they go to school and now we're gonna complain about the sex education. Seriously, it doesn't work like that. We can do a lot at home. Bring up children in such a way that they are pure human beings. Anything negative, they will be the first ones to stand up. This is impurity. You, they grow up pure, taqiyan, naqiyan. Fahisha is um, this lewdness or immorality or shamelessness. That's why the hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa hadith of Bukhari, he said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحْيِ فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتَ If you lose haya, if you lose modesty, there's two ways of, there's two meanings of this hadith. فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتَ If you lose haya, then you will do whatever you want. You will not care. If you lose modesty, you won't care. You will do anything. Because their nature becomes distorted. May Allah protect us, I mean all of us. The nature becomes fitra as-salima. Allah created us with this sound disposition. When that becomes the greatest calamity is when the sound disposition is distorted. When right looks wrong, wrong seems right. Haq seems batil, batil seems haq. That's a very bad state to be in. When sin just doesn't do anything for us or to us. May Allah protect us. Ameen. That's why the, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, when you lose modesty, haya, bashfulness, you will do whatever you want. In another hadith, he said, مَا كَانَ الْفُحْشُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَنَهُ وَمَا كَانَ الْحَيَاءُ فِي شَيْءٍ Sorry, مَا كَانَ الْفُحْشُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَادَ وَمَا كَانَ الْحَيَاءُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَنَهُ Shamelessness is never found in anything except it. It uh, makes it look ugly. And haya is not found in anything except that it adorns it. Many examples, and I'm gonna just mention one or two, and then I wanna talk about some really important things, just four or five points, and then I'll conclude, to do with some of like, the real issues. The companions, look at the, you know, so many examples before us, so many. We should read. Another good thing to do at home, we need to take practical lessons. These programs are practical lessons. Have a habit, brothers and sisters, take time out. We live in busy lives, I know. Collectively, at least once a week, if not more. At home, together, as a family. Read a book, the biographies, the seerah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Complete a book on Sira. Tell one of your children you read. Give everybody turns. Sit together collectively. Eat together. Eat together. And then read. Read the biographies of the Sahabiyat, female companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the male companions, Sahaba radiallahu anhum wa ardah, the Azwaj al Mutaharat the pure wives of the Messenger وسلم, the mothers of the believers, each one of them is role model for your daughters, each one of the main companions role model for, for your sons, for our sons. Read at home. Many, many examples. Uthman bin Affan عنه, was known, that's why in the khutbah they say, uh, what did they say? Astaquhum hayyan Uthman. The most haya Uthman had, anhu. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once sitting. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that he was sitting and a bit of his, you know, clothing was, you know, his, his leg was exposed. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu entered, took permission, 
He was granted permission, he came and sat down. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam remained how he was sitting. Then Umar came, radiallahu anhu, again gave permission, he carried on how he was. And then Uthman came, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam sat down. After they all left, he was asked, why did you change your position when Rahman came? He said, shall I not be shy and have haya from the one whom angels have shy and haya? He is bashful by nature. This also tells us that sometimes we need to, we need to consider the feelings of others. Sometimes someone is more bashful than we should try to be careful of not doing things which will you know, sort of be to their dislike, distaste. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu also example of haya and modesty. Ali radiallahu anhu, and I will mention this later, he once, he said, Kuntu rajulan madhaman. I had a problem of having pre-ejaculation fluid. Madhi. Some people, you know, a lot of the men have this uh, medical problem. And it's not like a major problem, it's quite common. I want you to know, do I have to wash it off? Do I have to do wudu? Do I have to do ghusl? Is there an obligatory bath necessary? But, فَاسْتَحْيَيْتُ I was ashamed of asking the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَكُنْتُ أَسْتَحْيِي لِمَكَانَةِ إِبْنَتِهِ Because our, his daughter was in my marriage. Now I will talk about this. Parents talking to their own children in the next section. So he said, فَأَمَرْتُ الْمِقْدَادِ I said to my friend Miqdad, you go and ask on my behalf. I can't ask him because I'm married to his daughter. I can't ask my father-in-law, I've got a problem with thee. This is bashfulness. That's, this is nature. Likewise, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he says that he once gave a khutbah. He said, oh people, Istahyu min Allah. Have modesty, haya from Allah. فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ By him in whose hands is my, in his possession is my life. إِنِّي لَأَظِلُّ حِينَ أَذْهَبُ الْغَائِتْ فِي الْفِضَاءِ When I go to the washroom, bathroom, I take cover. Remember those times the washroom, bathrooms were different. مُتَقَنِّعًا بِثَوْبِي I cover myself with a clothing, like cover. Only expose that much which is necessary. مِنْ رَبِّ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Out of modesty before my Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu anha says, and you know when the house that I used to live in, my, my husband passed away, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was buried there. And then my father passed away, he was buried there, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So when I used to go, the graves were close by, I, I never used to like, because they passed away, they've been buried. So, and there was my father and my mind. So I never used to be too careful about my hair being exposed. It's in my own house. But then when Umar, radiallahu anhu, passed away and he was buried there, I never used to enter that place because it was where she was living, exposing even my hair. There's no other man, just out of haya for Umar, before Umar. Now there's no ruling that you have to show haya before a person has passed away and left this world and gone to the next world. But it's just an absolute pinnacle. You know the famous story many of you have heard? Musa, peace be upon him. Musa, peace be upon him. What time is Salah? It's 8.25. Uh, Musa, peace be upon him. There's a long story to cut it short. You know when he was fleeing from Pharaoh and the people because you know for because of Musa he was punched someone and the guy died etc. And he left Misr, Egypt fleeing. Yeah. He, he was going through towards Madian. Madian. When he arrived at the water of Madian. He found a group of people watering the animals. And from along away from that group, he found two women. They were aloof, like just 
waiting on the side. Uh, probably those men weren't that gentle and they didn't tell the sisters, you know, you go ahead, I mean, alhamdulillah, and I was like, who tell them? Sisters, first. But they didn't. And they were not sisters that were just going to barge in and, you know, push the men away. Like some sadly do when you kiss the black stone, Hajj al That's another story. Rather than get a reward for kissing the black stone, you come with all the sins. For number one, harming, whether men or women, pushing, shoving, and then men and women like, like that. Anyway, so, وَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمُ مْرَأَتَيْنِ دَذُودَانِ He saw these two sisters. He said, قَالَ مَا خَطْبُكُمَا What's wrong, sisters? Is there anything okay? قَالَتَ لَا نَسْقِي حَتَّى يُصْدِرَ الرِّعَاءُ We are not able to water our animals until these shepherds don't go. وَأَبُونَا شَيْخٌ كَبِيرٌ We don't have no male relative to help us. Our father is an old man, he can't leave the house. فَسَقَى لَهُمَا Musa, peace be upon him, he helped them. He felt sorry for the sisters. Sometimes we should you know, help if you see someone in need. فَسَقَى لَهُمَا ثُمَّ تَوَلَّا إِلَى الْضِلْ He did the job, he filled it for them. The water, it was a well actually. And actually, the Mufassirun mentioned, this is not in the Quran wording, that they, you know what they did, the shepherds, they used to be very stingy. So when they used to finish watering, they used to put a massive rock on top of the well. Nobody comes and takes. You need 10 people to lift that rock. How many people? 10. And the sisters didn't have that energy. Musa, peace be upon him, one person. Done. Allah gave him a lot of strength, a lot of power. Afterwards, they went home. This is in between the verses, the tafsir. Because we need to know exactly which part is the Quran and which part is the commentary. They went home. The father asked that unusually you've come back home early. Like, what happened? Normally you come late because it's very difficult. So they told him the whole story. So then their father, their father, who was their father? The Mufassirun of the Quran have different opinions. But many say it was the Prophet of Allah, Shu'aim. But it's not categorical, but most likely it was him. So he sent one of them to go and call Musa. فَجَاءَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا In the Quran says, Afterwards one of the daughters came. One of them came. تَمْشِي عَلَى اسْتِحْيَا That's the word. Walking in modesty. The Quran talks about this. The way she came, in a modest way. قالت إن أبي يدعوك ليجزيك أجر ما سقيت لنا. My father is calling you. He wants to reward you for the help you gave us. Then he went. فلما جاء هو قص عليه القصص. قال لا تخف نجوت من القوم الظالمين. And then afterwards, then شعيب, if it was him, peace be upon him. No, the daughter actually said to the father that when he came home, that oh my father, you're you're old. We don't have any we don't have any brothers. There's no man in the house. Why don't you just employ him? The best person to employ you is the one who has two qualities. Number one, muscle man, powerful. How did they know that? The Mufassir would say because he lifted that rock, which was lifted by ten people. And he's, then the second quality, they said, Al Amin is trustworthy. You know how they knew about that? Because the way he dealt with them, he wasn't saying, sister, sister, you know, checking the heart and everything. You know, in, in, in the name of Islam, no. For which, whatever name. Real modesty. That attracts people. A sister is attracted by modesty. When someone in fitra salima. Inna khayra man istajat al qawi al ameen. And you know the Mufassirun, the commentators, they explained that, you know, when they were going to his house, you know what Musa, peace be upon him, said to them, to her, don't walk ahead of me, walk behind me. I don't want to walk behind you and, because you have, I have to follow you. I don't know where your house is. You walk behind. And tell me from the back. Right, left, next turn, tell me from the back. 
I'll just follow. And sometimes if you need to give directions like, it has to be gestures, like I can't hear you properly, and some commentators say that he told her to pick pebbles and throw, like pick one this way, pick another one this way. He would, did not put one gaze on her. And that affected her. And you know in this ayah when she said, Oh my father, take, her, uh, take uh, Musa as an employee. It was actually an indication that, you know what, wouldn't mind marrying him. And I'm going to talk about this at the end. What is not contrary to haya, which we think is haya. Cultural things which are not haya. A daughter telling her father, Father, you know, there's a really nice brother, I've heard about him. There's no, no, no unlawful relationship, nothing. I know, I've heard from sisters, he's a really good brother. Astaghfirullah, how dare you? You don't do that as a father. There's nothing wrong with that. Then Shu'ib, peace be upon him, proposed. إِنِّي أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُنْكِحَكَ إِحْدَى بْنَتَيَّ هَاتَيْنِ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تَأْجُرَنِي ثَمَانِيَ حِجَجِ I want you to marry you off with one of my daughters. Again, in our culture, how can the girl's father propose like, what's wrong with that? That's not against haya. Where are we not supposed to have haya? We think it's haya. That's culture. A daughter can ask her father. A woman can propose to a man, as long as it's all legitimate. There's, this, I was going to talk about this at the end, but I'll just mention it here. There's hadith in Bukhari where Imam al-Bukhari has a chapter heading. A man presenting his daughter to a righteous man for marriage. And then he mentions the hadith where Umar, uh, radiyal, sorry, not Umar radiallahu anhu, um, uh, Hafsa was the daughter of Uthman, yes, radiallahu anhu. When she lost her husband, Uthman went to Abu Bakr. My daughter's widow now, would you like to marry her? Simple society. There's no, if some, there's no like all these cultural restrictions. Oh, what will they say? Oh, this will say, what will happen? Did you ask the great granddad in Bangladesh? No, no. Oh, one of us will And this, all that stuff. Simple, clean, you know, frank society. Too much restrictions. Marriages were simple. There's no like, you know, the, the, all these cultural things. He went to Bakr, uh, sorry, Umar, radiallahu anhu. And he's, Umar said, let me think, but then he said, I'm not really like going to marry at this moment in time. Then he went to Abu Bakr. Are you interested? He just didn't respond. Afterwards, the Messenger of Allah is not proposed. Then Abu Bakr told him, that, you know what, when you said, I didn't want to say anything, I knew the Messenger of Allah had mentioned her. So I didn't want to disclose this or anything. That's why I didn't say yes. If the Messenger of Allah had not married, I would have married. But anyway, the chapter heading, and there's a few other chapters that a woman can present herself to a man, but with chastity, with purity, with, with, you know, with looking down, with gazes being low. So this daughter of Shu'ib, Tamshi al istihya she kind of requested her father or indicated or indicated to her father that she would like Musa as a husband. And then he married her. And the story carries on. So th these were some of the examples that we see of haya and the opposite of that, which is um, shamelessness. Now I just want to talk about one, the next part in a few points. But we have uh, many aspects of shamelessness today in our society. It's very, very sad. It's very difficult to avoid. Like I said, workplace, billboards, Internet, you can't open any part of the internet without seeing shamelessness. And these, sad, sadly we have these. One of the great, like one scholar said, the greatest fitna of the time is this. There's places in the world, one of my friends recently visited Mauritania. I met to many of those, I was last week in Abu Dhabi, and there was a conference there. 
many Mauritanian scholars came. There's people who haven't seen this in their life. Scholars, people in the 70s, there's only one phone in the village where you get signal once a week, you go and use that. Forget internet and all of that and Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp. Great means of fitna. They're beneficial as well, but great means of fitna. WhatsApp is like, subhanAllah. You know, like I was saying that somebody uh, said that in the olden times we used to say, like, you know, I'll contact you the traditional way. You know what the traditional way was? Like, I'll send you a letter. No, I won't email you. Let me post a letter to you. Now it's like, I'll contact you the traditional way. I'll email you. So email's gone. Like, you know, I, I still email. I'm still on the email. Alhamdulillah, I've resisted the temptation. I still don't have WhatsApp. You might say, so what? You've got Twitter. <laughs> but I just, I've never, ever, I just don't, I don't know. I just don't like WhatsApp. But people, when they ask, WhatsApp, it's like, that's farda'in. Like, what are, you, what are you doing? Where are you living? Why you don't have WhatsApp? It's too much time waste. I'm in the middle of the night going, ding. I woke up. Ding. I'm going to the toilet. Ding. I've just come out of the bathroom. Time is wasted. Marriages are broken. Seriously, marriages are broken. People sitting at home. Yeah, family is eating. The, girl, the boy is playing on his game. The girl, she's playing. The daughter, the father, the mother. Everyone's on the phone. I actually recently sort of... Uh, 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 um, uh, sorry, uh, I mentioned this to some people that every household should have a technology free, tech free zone. Every household, one and a half hours every day, tech free zone. If you want a good family relationship, Alhamdulillah, I started that in my house. And I suggested that to many of my friends. In the evening, which includes the father as well. Phone, band. Khalas, closed. Completely. The house, maybe just keep one house phone if emergency, something happens. But everything, iPads, laptops, phones, TV, whatever you have, I don't know all the different, completely, let's talk physically, let's talk, husband, wife, mother, daughter, son, let's, one and a half hours, just one and a half hours, try it, seriously, just take this from this lecture and nothing else, inshallah, that should be beneficial, every day, at least start with one hour, yeah, I'll do what the tabliq jama'a people do, tashkil, come on, who's gonna, put your hands up, who, who will do that? I won't. But seriously, try it. One hour, one and a half hours. Completely, just all electronics off. Physical relationship. We have all these problems. Yeah, phone, all these means of fuhsh. Zina, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned in a hadith of Bukhari, one of the signs of Qiyamah is وَيَكْثُرْ zina. Zina will become widespread. That doesn't mean actual zina. Every form of zina. Zina al-ayni al-nadar. The zina of the eyes to see. Zina al-udhun al-istima'ah. Zina of the ear is to hear. Zina al-yad al-batsh. The zina of the hand is to touch. Zina of the feet is to walk towards the evil. Wal-farju yusaddiquhu wa yukadhibuhu. Finally, the private parts may confirm all that other zina or may not. All these forms of zina. The Quran says, Wala taqrabu zina. Innahu kana fahisha. Don't even get close to it. Forget doing zina. Don't even get close to it. Which means all the means of zina must be blocked by elders, by youth at home. The Quran says, Qad aflaha al mu'minun al ladinahum fi salatihim khashi'un wal ladinahum anil laghu mu'ridun wal ladinahum li zikati fa'ilun wal ladinahum li furujihim hafidun. Who are the people of falah and success? Those who preserve their guard, their private parts. Famani ibtaga wa ra'a thalik. Those who search for fulfilling their carnal desires beyond that, beyond marriage. إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْمَا مَلَكْتَ إِمَانُهُمْ 
yeah, so who preserve their private parts except in marriage and then beyond and outside of marriage, Allah says, adun." These are the real transgressors. All the means to zina must be blocked. Because again, it goes back to the heart. It starts with the thought. It starts with the thought, eyes. The eyes are the messengers to the heart. Once we see evil things with our eyes, that's why the Quran says, Tell the believing men to lower the gaze. And that, after that, guard their private parts because the gaze is connected. That's the introduction to guarding the private parts. So which means that casting lustful gazes with desire, sexual gazes, that's what it means. It's best, it's better as haya to always keep the gaze low, whatever, that's normal haya. But what is unlawful and what the Quran is saying that preserve and guard your, your gazes from casting sexual, looking at nudity, looking at obscene things, immoral things, whether in person or whether on the screen. We live in a time, and I know people have been frank here, Porn is one of the greatest problems, brothers and sisters, biggest problem. It starts with the eye. That eye then translates all the filth and the junk into the heart and the mind. The thoughts are in there. In the beginning, people are disturbed. But then our fitrah is distorted. Things become over and over and over again when we are sort of accustomed to filth and dirt over and over and over again, we don't even realize that that thing is bad no longer anymore. We become desensitized. The filth no longer remains filth. Porn is one of the greatest problems. We must tackle this. It's never been as easy to have access to porn than it is today. Click off a button on this. Click off a button. Seriously. Probably you guys don't know, alhamdulillah, may Allah protect you. Nobody knows. It's a click of a button. That's how it's easy to access it. If we are giving our children seven-year-old's phone, I seriously think we should not be giving our children their own mobile phones. Then we complain, we have no right to complain then. How can we hand our nine-year-old's and eight-year-old's their own personal mobile phones with the internet? And then we're worried what they're gonna do in the school curriculum. They have their phones. They don't need to go to the, you know, to the school. They just have to take their phones out and just go Google and just put S-E-X and see what comes up. Let them grow old. I personally would never give my child a f his own mobile phone until they reach about 19, 20. Seriously. I'd call me old school and old fashioned. You can't have your own phone. But we bring them up like that. Have internet at home. They can't have a personal internet or a laptop or access to their personal in the privacy of the room have one in the central dining room have internet at home not in their rooms don't give them ipads 10 year olds 12 year olds yeah you need to do work no problem use it but it's here and you know the trick is that you know the the the, the screen don't keep it towards the wall the, the, the back of the, the, the laptop or the computer should be against the wall. So anyone's walking past, they can see what's on the screen. Children are very smart nowadays. Yeah, you know, they have 102,000 profile names and secret numbers and messages. Something the father might see it looks like, you know, um, some, some technical problem, but I don't know what that is. It's another technical problem. They're very clever. Parents need to be sharp so don't give access these are all the means protect the gaze porn as I was saying it's really destructive and this is my first message and the second message to the parents will, I will mention but seriously this is preserve and guard your modesty young people everybody all of us porn is destructive as I said once once someone gets accustomed to filth and dirt, this person becomes desensitized. Then people, human beings, 
you know, when they get married, this actually causes breakdown of, causes marriage breakdown. One of the great reasons of marital breakdown is because pre-marriage, the man or the woman was addicted to porn. It's an addiction. It's got, what is it called? Dop dop dopamine or something, whatever it's called. There's, there's a whole website on this. It's an addiction. And you know what happens? I, I read this whole thing. That this addiction, it starts off, the person no longer is satisfied with a particular brand of porn. They move on to the next one. Then that doesn't do the job for them. They move on to the next one. That doesn't do anything for them. When they get married, their wives, they can't satisfy their wives. Porn creates the psychological impotency. You have actual impotency. This is psychological. This man in his marriage cannot satisfy his wife. But if there's some porn, he'll be able to satisfy himself. Read upon this. And by Allah, I am not making this up. I've had cases. I had once a sister crying, a wife. And my husband sleeping in my bed next to me does not have physical relationship with me, but he's masturbating with porn in the same bed. It's like you've got a wife. What's happened? There's more kick, more buzz from the porn rather than the marital relationship. Because it's just a mere sex object. That's what that porn does to two people. Bad habits at a young age. You know, some people think that, you know what, I'll sort myself out at marriage. Believe me, brothers and sisters. If we do not sort our, these kind of problems before marriage, we could be married, we will still have the same habit. Another example, this brother once was crying a few, two, three years ago. He was an old man, I don't know, in his 50s or 60s, Allahu Alam. He said, I started the habit of masturbation when I was like 15, 16. I'm a grandfather, I still can't come out from the habit. I still can't come out from the habit. It remains, it's long-term habits. Young people think, so well, it's like, you know, bachelor, let's just relax and enjoy. When I get married, then I'll settle down. Then I'll sort everything out. Those who are clubbing will carry on clubbing. Pre-marriage pre clubbing will carry on clubbing after marriage. Those who are womanizing, or menonizing, I don't know whatever if that term's there, they will carry on doing that after marriage. It won't stop them because it becomes, it's a different kick, it's a different buzz. Seriously, we, we, that's why I tell a lot of my friends that, you know, before marriage, that's why Quran says, you know when people get married, what does the Imam recite? The ayat of taqwa, the verse of taqwa. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu taqullah haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. And the other two, Ya Yuhannasu Taqwa Rabbakum Alladhi Khalaqakum Min Nafsi Wahida. Those three ayats, verses of taqwa. At the time of marriage, that's sunnah. It's a khutbah the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited. Why? What's the objective behind it is to remind us that before marriage, at the time of marriage, and after marriage, the only thing that will preserve someone's marriage is taqwa. After marriage, the actual marriage, and even before marriage, before marriage, live a life of taqwa. If somebody, and it's never too late, the doors of tawbah are always, alhamdulillah, open. We can all turn to Allah. But this, I always suggest to a lot of my friends, if you want to get married, and if you've got some of these bad, evil habits, don't get married now. Spend one year of chastity. One year. Don't masturbate today and get married tomorrow. Sorry for being frank. One year, preserve yourself. Then go and get married. One year, taqwa before marriage. Then it will help you in your marriage. You have to get into the habit of not doing those bad and evil acts. So all these things. Masturbation is, it's, it's haram. There's no two, two questions about that. It's harmful. Don't let anyone tell you that there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, what are you going to masturbate? Look, look at you know, the ceiling and masturbate. What are you going to think about? 
evil thoughts. It's a zina of the brain, zina of the mind, zina of the aql, zina of the intellect. How can a person masturbate without thinking? And this is zina, zina of the thought. It creates darkness in the heart. And then that actually results in all these other evils and vices. I know people have talked about homosexuality and things like that. Lots of sexual deviances, which are unlawful in Islam, but there are sexual deviances. About homosexuality, people ask, look, we, don't, we can't change our religion. Christianity, Judaism, Islam. All revealed religions consider it to be sinful. Straightforward, khalas. There's no, we can't compromise. This is our deen. Yes, we don't hate a person. Just like we don't hate a person, we don't, we don't get over-obsessed as well. People ask, you know, sometimes we, we get over-obsessed with one sin because it's culturally like a taboo. So we, don't, we shouldn't get obsessed. Just like, you know, someone doesn't pray fajr, that's also a sin. Someone's not praying fajr, that's also a sin. Someone's involving themselves in homosexual activity, that's also a sin. So the way you are unhappy with this sin, be unhappy with this sin. Okay, so with that balance, you, you never, just like you don't hate your brother or sister who missed their dhuhr salah, you don't hate your brother or sister who is involved. You help, you encourage, you still be friends, you be nice to them, you try to help them. And this is actually, these things are actual, you know, these are evil habits. Because you know, I'll tell you one thing, most of the people who are in homosexual relationships, they, don't, they are not like faithful to one person, very rarely. It's they have multiple partners, multiple. And then the diseases and the illnesses and sicknesses, I mean, read up on that. Some of the things the researchers have mentioned, and the Messenger وسلم, was truthful when he said, one of the signs of Qiyamah, a time will come when people will be afflicted with such diseases and such illnesses that your, your fathers and your fa forefathers would have never had heard of them. They will kill you and there'll be no remedy for them. It's a sound hadith. Absolutely sound hadith. STDs and AIDS and whatever, whatever. So, young people, protect yourself. We should all protect ourselves. I'll just mention what we need to do. Number one, nothing can happen except resolve. I know, just, just one or two minutes, I'm gonna conclude. Nothing can happen without resolve. Firm resolve. No one's going to help us if we don't help ourselves. You know, people say, oh, Shaykh, make this dua, go to this imam. You know, please. Of course, but we need himma, resolve. And we need to turn to Allah, make dua. To, to sort of help us and protect us from these things. And elders should explain in a gentle way. You know, once there's a hadith in Musnad Ahmad, a man came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Oh, messenger of Allah, he is then leave zina. Please give me permission, I want to do zina. You know, two, three days ago, somebody sent me a message. I, I, I would like to do zina. Can I do zina? Because of maslaha. I, don't, I didn't get it what he was trying to say. I'd like to do zina because of maslaha. I, I didn't really understand. But he reminded me of this incident. So what? Like, I didn't think bad of him. The person came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, oh, Messenger of Allah, please give me permission. I want to do zina. He, he wasn't Im, like an imam of today like me. Like, astaghfirullah. What are you talking about zina? No, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, come here, brother. Atuhibbuhu li ummik? Would you like someone committing zina with your mother? He said, la wallahi ya rasulullah. No, Messenger of Allah. Wala nasu yuhibbuna li ummahatihim. Others don't like their mothers being fornicated with as well. أَتُحِبُّهُ لِخَالَتِكَ Do you like someone commit zina with your auntie? With your paternal auntie? He, made, he listed with your sister, with your daughter. Every time he said no, O Messenger of Allah. He said, likewise, others don't like their sisters, someone committing zina with her, their auntie. He understood. And then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa placed his hand on his heart and he said, Allahumma, Allahumma ghfir dhamba wa hassin farjahu wa tahir qalbahu. O oh Allah, forgive his sin, purify his heart, and forgive his sin, and preserve his modesty. He says, since that day, the thought of zina did not even come to my mind. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Explain to the young people in a nice way. But these things, resolve. We need resolve. We have to do, look, 
we have to do what we need to do. You know, Yusuf, peace be upon him, he was seduced by a beautiful woman. Beautiful woman of position, of rank. The woman's giving money of rank and beauty. She bolted the doors. Everyone knows the story. It's no time. She locked the doors. You know what Yusuf, peace be upon him, did? He ran to the doors. He knew the doors are locked. The Mufassirun say that he, well, you know why he ran to the doors? At least I can run to the doors. The rest is up to Allah. Like, I can do, go to the door. I know it's locked. I have to do what's in my capacity. Leave the rest to Allah. And the doors opened. Allah opened it for him. He said, Qala ma'ad Allah. Likewise, in a hadith, a woman, you know, seven young people who are under the shade of Allah on a day that there'll be no shade, one of them is Rajulun da'atu imra'atun dhata jamalin wa mansab. A man who was seduced, called, invited by a woman of beauty and rank. Faqala inni akhaf Allah. He says, I fear Allah. Like for the sake of Allah, we need this taqwa, we need this resolve. But it starts, like I said, at home, taqwa, you know, bringing up children, good society, at home. If you do all of this, and then alongside that, the rest of the things that we talked about today, very important, mashallah, you heard from some real good people today. Of course, we need to work for the betterment of our children. We have to do whatever, we need to rally, we need to sort of, you know, we need to really... Do whatever we can do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children. The greatest responsibility, one of my teachers was saying, the greatest issue for the Muslims in the West is not about the moon. It's not about times of prayer. It's not about Eid. It's not about splitting of the moon. It's not about putting hands here, putting hands here. I mean, loudly, silent. You know, it's, they are small issues, tribal issues. In comparison to the preservation of the iman of our children. The greatest, greatest responsibility. When we leave our children, will they be believers or not? That is a question. That is a question. The iman. And if we can't guarantee that, then I don't know what we're doing here. Sorry, you know, uh, it seems quite um, harsh, but we have to, we have to really work for our children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our young children, our youth, protect all of you, inshallah. Grant me as well the ability to practice on what I said. May Allah make things easy for the Muslims, inshallah. Jazakallah khaira qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa sallamu alaykum.